Good evening. It's good to see you. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Robert Vera, and I'm here to introduce you to the service and also give you a safety briefing. <laughs> a little bit later in the service, we will be handing you a live flame. I have been asked to show you how to accept this flame as we come uh, down the aisle. And as you can see, our fire is already starting to go out there. So as, uh, as we come down the aisle with the Paschal candle, a uh, lay Eucharistic minister or a person in a white vest or a white robe like this will light the first person in the row. And once that happens, you take the flame from them. Now here's the thing, don't take the lit flame and pour it on the person. Take the unlit one and use it to light. Clear as mud. So we start with the, we start with lighting the new fire. And our children have uh, also worked so hard to prepare for this night. So once again, thank you for being here. I'll ask that you please stand and uh, face the narthex. Let us begin. Dear friends in Christ on this most holy night, in which our Lord Jesus Christ passed over from death to life, the church invites her members dispersed throughout the world to gather in vigil and prayer. For this is the Passover of the Lord, in which by hearing God's word and celebrating God's sacraments, we share in Christ's victory over death. Let us pray. O God, through your Son, you have bestowed upon your people the brightness of your light. Sanctify this new fire and grant that in this Paschal feast we may so burn with heavenly desires that with pure minds we may attain to the festival of everlasting light through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Light of Christ, thanks be to God. The light of Christ. Thanks be to God. The light of Christ.
deeds and how God saved God's people in ages past. And let us pray that our God will bring each of us to the fullness of redemption. If you would like to, I invite you to extinguish your candles now. Think about the biggest present you ever got. Do you remember what it was? Did you know that you've been given a present so huge that it's hard to see? Sometimes the only way to see this gift is to go all the way back to the beginning, or maybe a little bit before the beginning. In the beginning, in the beginning there was, well, there wasn't very much. In the beginning there was nothing except perhaps an enormous smile. But there was no one there to see it. Then, on the very first day, God gave us the gift of light. I don't just mean the light in a light bulb or in car lights at night. I don't mean any one light. I mean all the light that is light. God gave us the gift of light that all light comes from. And when God saw the light, God said, it is good. And that was the end of the first day. On the second day, God gave us the gift of water. I don't mean just the water in a glass or a bathtub or swimming pool or even just the water in a river or lake or ocean, or the water that comes down from the sky as rain or snow. I mean all the water that is water. God gave us the gift of water that all water comes from. When God saw the water, God said, it is good, and that was the end of the second day. On the third day, God gave us the gift of dry land. God divided the water from the dry land and gave us the gift of all the green and growing things. When God saw the dry land and all the green and growing things, God said, it is good. And that was the end of the third day. On the fourth day, God gave us the gift of day and night. With this gift, we have a way to count our days. The sun is the great light that rules the day. The moon and stars are the lights that rule the night. And when God saw the day and night, our way to keep time, God said, it is good. And that was the end of the fourth day. On the fifth day, God gave us the gift of all the creatures that fly in the air. Not just the birds, but all the creatures that fly. And all the creatures that swim in the water, all of them. When God saw all the creatures flying in the air and swimming in the water, God said, it is good. And that was the end of the fifth day. On the sixth day, God gave us the gift of all the creatures that walk upon the earth, the creatures that walk with two legs, like you and me, and all the creatures that walk with many legs. When God saw the creatures that walk with two legs and the creatures that walk with many legs and all the gifts of the other days, God said, it is very good. And that was the end of the sixth day. On the seventh day, God rested. And God gave us the gift of a day to rest and remember the great gifts of all the other days of creation. We are a part of God's creation and what an incredible gift it is. Let us say together, it is good. Please rise. And let us pray. O oh God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity 
your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As soon as Pharaoh heard that the Israelites had left Egypt, he changed his mind about sending them away. He commanded his warriors, get all my war chariots ready and let's chase after them. We should have not let them go. Uh, he, he and his men began chasing the Israelites. God was leading the people using a cloud during the day and fire at night. God led them to the Red Sea and told them to set up camp. Then the Israelites saw Pharaoh and his army chasing after them. Between the Red Sea and the Egyptian army, they cried out to Moses, We are going to die. You should have left us in Egypt. But Moses said, Do not be afraid. Wait and see how God will save us. God told the Israelites to break camp. That night, God moved the cloud and placed it between the Egyptians and the Israelites. On the Egyptian side, there was darkness, but on the Israelite side, there was light. God told Moses to stretch out his hand over the sea. Then God made a strong wind blow all night long. The sea was split in two, and there was a pathway down the middle. The millions of Israelites marched on dry ground, between the walls of water to the other side. Pharaoh's army followed the Israelites on into the dry seabed. Then God threw the army into confusion. The wheels began to fall off their war chariots. The soldiers shouted, let's get out of here. God is fighting for them. God told Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea. At once, the walls of water collapsed on the Egyptian army. On the other side of the sea, the large crowd of people praised God with a song. Sing to God, for he has become highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. While the people sang, the woman danced and played tambourines. Everyone was very happy that now they were truly free. Here ends the reading. Please rise. And let us pray. O oh God, whose wonderful deeds of old shine forth even to our own day, you once delivered by the power of your mighty arm your chosen people from slavery under Pharaoh, to be a sign for us of the salvation of all nations by the water of baptism. Grant that all the peoples of the earth may be numbered among the offspring of Abraham and rejoice in the inheritance of Israel through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Ezekiel lived nearly 600 years before Jesus came to earth. He was God's prophet among thousands of Jewish captives taken from Judah to Babylon before the destruction of Jerusalem. There were very dark days for the people of God. But through some amazing visions, God gave Ezekiel a message of hope to share with those discouraged and enslaved exiles. Listen to Ezekiel's words. God's mighty power came over me, and God's spirit carried me to a most unusual place. I was in the middle of a valley, a valley that looked like a massive battlefield. Everywhere I looked, I saw old dry bones, thousands of dry bones scattered about and bleached by the sun. As I walked in this valley of death and destruction, God asked me, do you think these old dry bones can ever live again? Is that possible? I replied, Lord, only you know the answer to that question, but with you, nothing is impossible. Then God told Ezekiel to cry out to those bones and say, Lord, you are going to walk around again. For though you are all dried up and lifeless, God will make you live and breathe again. Suddenly, there was a thundering noise all across the valley. Ezekiel heard all kinds of racket as those bones began to rattle and shake and tremble. And right before Ezekiel's eyes, God's spirit breathed into the dry bones. 
Next thing he knew, those old dry bones got up, attached to each other like before, and stood on their feet like a great army. For all we know, those bones started walking around and dancing for joy. After seeing this vision from God, this is the message of hope that Ezekiel brought back to God's people. We have become just like a pile of lifeless, old, dried up bones. Our spirit is dead and our hope is gone. But just as God breathed life into those bones in the valley, God's spirit will live in us again too. God will cause us to rise up from the valley and return to our homes. And by this, we will know that God cares for us. Thanks be to God. Beloved, please rise. And let us pray. Almighty God, by the Passover of your Son, you have brought us out of sin into righteousness and out of death into life. Grant to those who are sealed by your Holy Spirit the will and the power to proclaim you to all the world through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On the first day of the week, early at dawn, the women who traveled with Jesus from Galilee came to the tomb bringing spices. Among the women were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Jesus and, and Mary, Jesus' mother. Saturday was the Sabbath day, so the women waited until Sunday to anoint Jesus. It was dangerous for them to come to Jesus' tomb at all because those who had put Jesus to death were still looking for his disciples. So, the women came quietly with their spices early on Sunday morning. Yet, the women were not the first ones to visit the tomb. Before they arrived, God had been there. God had came so close to Jesus, and Jesus came so close to God. During Jesus' life, the authorities had tried to stop him, to say no to his way of living and loving. They crucified Jesus on the cross and killed him. But God had another plan. God entered Jesus' tomb and cried, yes. God said yes to Jesus and Jesus' way of living and dying. God said yes to Jesus' life of mercy and healing. God called, get up, Emmanuel, come forth, Jesus. Like Miriam and Moses coming forth from the Red Sea, Jesus rose out of the watery depths. He broke the bonds of death, and Jesus rose to new life. And God said, it is very good. All of creation shouted for joy. The flowers bloomed, the green growing things clapped their hands, the stars danced, and the angels sang. God wept for joy and danced with the angels around the cosmos. The reign of God had triumphed throughout all creation. Life had conquered death. Jesus, who had been crucified, was alive. So, when the women arrived, they found the stone had, rolled, had been rolled away from the tomb. There was no body in the tomb, and they were perplexed. Then suddenly, two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. When the women heard this news, their hearts were made new and filled with joy. Empowered by joy and belief, the women became the first apostles and shared this good news with the disciples. Tonight, we share this good news with each other. Beloved, I ask that you please rise. I've been waiting six weeks to say this. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. O God, who made this most holy night to shine with the glory of the Lord's resurrection, 
Help us to say yes to Jesus' life of mercy and healing. Jesus rose from the dead to show us that God's loving kindness will never die. On this holy night, all creation rejoices. The angels show us God's loving kindness will never die. On this holy night, all creation rejoices. The angels sing in the flowers of promise bloom. Tonight, he whom none may touch was seized, and he who loosed Adam from the curse was bound. The creator was struck by the hand of his creation, and he who comes to judge the living and the dead was condemned to the cross. And the destroyer of hell was enclosed in a tomb. The eternally begotten Son of God, Jesus, came to die at the hands of God's own creation, God's own beloved. And on Good Friday, we let that inspire awe and silence, and we can let Jesus' work be seen for what it was. And in the hours that passed today, we let the way of a quiet power over death and the stillness of a tomb shame the powers of this world, because after the death of Jesus, no one rested easy. The disciples were scared, and they were hiding. And there was no rest for the wicked who wanted to maintain their power. Pontius Pilate's wife, who told Pilate to have nothing to do with the condemnation of Jesus, is still being plagued by nightmares. And I imagine that makes Pilate's own sleep restless. And the religious leaders could not help but fear a conspiracy to remove Jesus' body, so they asked Pilate to post a guard at his tomb. In the time that Jesus is in the tomb, the weakness of humanity is in display all around. And the powerful with the ability to destroy cower and grasp for control about the story they're going to tell about Jesus. But tonight, in the stillness of a tomb, a soft gasp of a body resurrected will inspire a chorus of angels that will shout down the powerful and the forces of death. Tonight, the cell's dissolution reverses. The molecules re-knit. The amino acids rekindle. And the same hinged fingers and thumbs and toes, that same heart that pierced, died, withered, and paused, regathers. And out of enduring might, new strength encloses it. And Christ rose and rises still. In the words of a Paschal sermon by St. John Chrysostom, written 1,600 years ago, Christ has destroyed death by undergoing death. He despoiled hell by descending into hell. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, hell, where is your victory? Help me out here. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And death is annihilated. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. And the evil ones are cast down. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. And life is liberated. Christ is risen. And the Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. And the tomb is emptied of its dead. For Christ, having risen from the dead, is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. When Christ rose, when Jesus rose, he judged the worst that humanity can do and experience. Death still stalks us, but it's an evil whose back has been broken. Evil is still apparent, but it's a force that rages in retreat. Because the resurrection shows us that death is no longer the horizon we cannot see past. Instead, our vision through Jesus shows us eternity. In joining our life to Jesus in baptism, we die to sin. Because our choices now have a new reference point. What we do with courage and in hope echoes with eternal significance. And our destiny is now shaped by hope in the promise that in the final reckoning, no good is wasted. No good is wasted. And goodness is invincible. And all that is, 
and all that will be is redeemed in the good purposes of God. That is our promise and our hope on Easter. Tonight we celebrate in baptism that we are raised to new life in Christ. And we bring Rachel and Meredith who come tonight to be baptized. So let us pledge our support to them. Let us renew our commitment to live as Jesus taught us to. And let us remember our own baptism through which we are pledged to eternal life in God's love. Amen.